Morning. 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 All right, let's uh, work through a couple of announcements. First of all, I've got some things to pass around here to you. Make sure I got the right stuff for the right thing. Okay, this first one that I'm going to pass around is the Valentine dinner sign up sheet. Okay, and. Uh, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, get fried chicken from Kenny's, and then we're going to do potatoes any kind, um, corn any kind, string beans any kind, and of course a dozen rolls, whatever. Um, Jello salads, uh, cake. Uh, you don't have to coordinate. We're all doing the same thing. You just make what whatever, and please, when you say I'm going to make potatoes, if you're going to make scallop, write that out there in case somebody else wants to know and make something different to go with it. Um, we are not going to serve it this year as in sit down and, and we're going to bring it to you because we're doing it a little different and making it to where you can come up and get the various things. And so um, it, it does not matter. You don't have to feel like, well, then, then everybody won't get to have. It's going to be up buffet style and then after that. Then the folks will come through and serve you and help you and take care of things. We also have servers and child care workers. Um, these are people. Okay, uh, servers and child care workers. And uh, if you'd be interested in helping in either, you can do uh, both to an extent, uh, but maybe not the whole time. And we will have uh, babysitting for the children. And uh, so then the second sheet is who's coming to the the Valentine banquet, just to give us an idea of, for instance, how much chicken to get, okay? So, uh, first page is what you are willing to bring to make sure we can do it. Second page is, um, you know, are you coming, okay? Now, we got a second one here. And this one is for the Helm family, um, for their meals, um, they just had their... Well, why don't, I, why don't I let Sarah stand and, and tell us? So, they had a boy, and his name is Aaron Richard B. Helm. And, and he was like six pounds, two so ounces, 19 inches tall. And he was born at 114 in the afternoon on Wednesday. They were going to induce her, but she had a little bit of a All right, now they've taken the liberty of making for you a picture of the baby. So um, they're, they're trying to make sure you really uh, know what you're working towards here with the food. And when you sign up, please see the baby and, and sign up for some good food. You guys aren't small enough. They didn't say any of that. I'm saying it. But here's the baby for you. So we'll start this one on this side, make sure it goes all the way around. Again, if you use more um, spots that are on here, if you, you can't do it this time and you want to sign up for something else, just add it. Okay, that's fine. No one will care if you bring more. Uh, but um, there you go. Okay, so that's for the Helen family. Oh, um, with them, there, there are a few. I'll give it to you first. There are a few uh, in the family. Um, who don't like stuff mixed, like casseroles. They don't like casseroles. Um, so if you send a casserole, they would pick out what they'll eat. <laughs> but that becomes tedious and not quite as enjoyable as you might originally intend. And so for your benefit, you're better with the Helm family if you make separated things. Okay, separate it. Okay, so that they can say, I like corn and put that, and I like this and put that, and I like this and put that, but not, ooh. Um, recently, uh, uh, Amy made a, a meal for someone that uh, we, we know and care about that had surgery, um, not from our church, and this individual's children 
um, ate the meal and the kid said, boy, this looks nasty, but it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's awful hard to get past the nasty part uh, for what you might think is the greatest. So keep that in mind while you're preparing food for the Helm family, okay? All right, and uh, Lynn, let's see, as we go down through here, um, you got your note about that. Uh, this evening, I'm not sure what to do with the seed. No one wants to tell me what to do with the seed. Um, they, I, I was, uh, you know, going to stick with it and see whether it just ended up being ugly. Um, yeah, that's what most of the time you see. So, um, but I, I'm planning on uh, staying with the normal schedule. Uh, but no one. Dismissing early. Okay. Uh, you know how fun that is for me, right? Dismiss early. We all got lazy here, like Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> All right, um, so I think we'll just go with normal times and see how the weather is, um, because there's just too much you don't know. If we knew it was going to be more ugly, uh, then we pump things up, but it, it might end up being ugly, and I think they're gun shy of making the call, but um, I'd hate to be in New York and cancel everything and then have a decent weather. So, um, all right. Okay, uh, let's see. Then we have looking ahead, Valentine banquet in the fellowship hall. You already got that. Uh, we have communion, Valentine communion on February 15th. Um, we're, we're having a baby shower for James and Mindy March 1st, right after the morning service. Um, uh, March 2nd, we're having our board meeting, April 1st. Um, of course, no Wednesday evening prayer service, and then Good Friday, you'll see all that in there as well. I think that's it on those types of announcements. And weather permitting, we're still continuing on with our little study of the divine role of Jesus, and that he is the prophet. Uh, we were talking about, if you notice, at the very end of class, we were talking about, if you notice the emphasis of Islam, the emphasis is that, that Jesus was a prophet, and Muhammad is... The prophet. And frequently we miss what the, the real emphasis of that is. The real emphasis is the exact same thing that our Holy Scripture tells us. Jesus is the prophet, which means Jesus is the God. Okay, and that's what we're looking at. And so, uh, in, in general, the Muslims are attempting to, to hijack that and make it to where Muhammad is the prophet, the God. Okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, but we're, we're looking at that tonight and studying that out. And uh, that is a great time if you want to look the sheet over. i got a few up here before we, we start with. Okay? And uh, I think that's it. I'm accepting. There. Still collecting for Brittany in the, the foyer. If you need to do that. And uh, I think we'll hold off on this certificate just because the rest of them are here. The family's not here to see it, right? You think so? Um, I mean, I don't mind calling Kelly up here, but I... You can watch it on YouTube. Kelly, do you have a verse ready you'd like to say to us? Well, come on up here and say it, and then I'll, I'll get out a pen and sign this. You can turn right there and say it to them. They can see it. Luke 5.32, I do not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Very good. So what all do you have to do? What all do you have to do to complete the level? You have to do Christian services and verses. What, what would be a Christian service? Like what was a major Christian service that you recently did? Did you <laughs> you were the major actor in a play. Yes, that's Christian service. Or helping a neighbor take care of something, or making a meal with mommy and taking it to somebody's house. You guys have done that a couple of times too. All right. Um, so uh, a lot of other things: reading the scripture, um, faithfully reading and studying, 
uh, memory verses, reading a good book uh, that has some Christian uh, understanding to it. Very good, Cal. We're real proud of you. Good job. All right. Now, I think that's it on announcements. Okay. So, now let's uh, go ahead and sing together number 438. Precious Lord, take my hand. 438. Stand together as we sing. Sing out unto the Lord.
Give us heart, Lord, that it might just uh, bring forth fruit in our lives, and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. I'm going to down again, Lord. Let's sing another song. Number 420. 420. Let's sing it through twice.
Okay, this time the elders must <coughs> make a patty. you know what, 
I think that's the verse the Lord wants us to use. So we went away from what I had uh, originally planned, and uh, um, we're, we're uh, going to look at this verse together today. And uh, so you can find this verse mentioned in three different passages. We'll read the context in all three, compare them. But then what I really want to do is I want to show you the original, um, where, where Christ is quoting this from, is what I want to do about prayer. But the first thing I'd like to, to ask you to do is to think about <coughs> building houses. A lot of people build their house with different things. You know, maybe, maybe the Lord's the center of some homes, um, maybe the Bible, maybe TV, maybe a work schedule. There's a lot of things that we build our house with. Of course, the Bible says, unless the Lord build the house, we labor in vain to build it, um, you know, etc. As I look at this scripture, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what are we building our house with? And what was God's purpose for building this house? For this assembly? What was God's purpose for that? Okay, before we get too far into this, what I want to do is I want to ask uh, Mike and Ames if you would pass these out. Um, we want to give one to each family, okay? And I know that I had you all fill this out, but I got to thinking that was about six years ago, five years ago, and that means that some of you might have a different telephone number than what I originally had on the schedule. Some of you might have a different setup. You might have an answer machine when you didn't have one before. You, you might uh, have originally said, I'm working full time. I can't call through to somebody else. Uh, and you want to now, and so we're just going to do it again. And we'll do this this week and next week, and then the communion week will pass out our new um, schedule for how we call through the prayer chain, okay? And uh, what we're going to do with that, and take care of it. Thank you, fellas. Um, so I'd like you to fill it, okay? And put your name on there, and is the first thing that we're going to do. You're going to put your name on there, and you're going to mark what your choice is. Now, you don't mark all three. <laughs> okay. It, the underline is the main part of each section. Either you want to only receive calls. Now look, there is no shame in saying, I want to be in the know and I want to receive calls, but I'm not comfortable calling somebody else's house. There's no shame in that. Okay? And, and we recognize there are some of you that are out there that say, you know what, I want to receive the call, but I don't want to call. That's fine. Okay? That's fine. You mark that first one. I will receive calls and I will call the next person. If you're willing to be a part of the actual moving chain, then you mark that one. Or I am willing to call extra people. That one you might, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, mark both, but obviously if you're willing to call extra people, you've already marked the middle one, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and what, what we mean by that is a couple of folks that, say for instance, don't want to call somebody else, they're going to need a call from someone. But we don't want the chain to drop. So you need to call the person who's going to pass it on, plus one or two other people. And if you're willing to do that, I'll give you two or three names with telephone numbers, and you call those individuals, and you ask them to take this prayer request. And when we get to February 15th, we are going to actually talk to you about how we want you to handle this. Because we want this to be a teaching moment for your family. To, to pray. As I said, we'd like to eventually get it to where you know, we make a habit when we get these phone calls and that they don't have to be just emergencies because it's too much of a hassle to call through type idea, which is where I think it is kind of now, if you know what I'm saying. Um, but what we want to do is we want to, Mickey, you don't have to worry about it. You're, you're the, the top of the chain. You, you, you have to call multiple people to begin with, so... <laughs> He's up here talking to Mike about what did he go to sign up for. You're the one that's called first, so. <laughs> all right. Um, and we'll explain all of what we want you to do, just because we want to make it streamlined and make sure we actually make it to the end of the prayer chain to where people aren't saying, well, I never got a call. And I'm going to try to help you set that up in a better way. Write down your phone number. Um, you, you know, there was an initial thought of having you put down two, but I think that's kind of unfair to the person calling because then they have to call this number, then that number, then that number, and if you're not home at all three after they've called you three different numbers, then they still have to call the next person to make sure the chain isn't broken. 
and the end result is they might end up five or six numbers down the road uh, because we list the numbers. So give me the number that you have an answer machine on or that you received your, your phone calls on and it doesn't have to be to every person in the family, okay? The object would be to call one and that person post it and everybody pray for it. And we'll, we'll talk to you about that when the time comes. Okay, and then the, the important question, do you have voicemail or some variation thereof where a message can be left? Uh, because that also is important. The hardest thing for us when we're calling through and it's busy um, is that you can't leave a message and so you don't know what to do. And so it, it helps us to know whether you have a voicemail that we can leave on. Okay, back to the message now. Um, people build their houses with a lot of things, is the first thing I was talking about. What did God build his house based upon? What was God's focus in what the church ought to be? What should the church be all about? Um, I, I'm sad to say that as I think through, and I'm not trying to be judgmental to, with this, but as I think through um, churches in general, what are they known for? What does society know churches for? What do they think about churches? Collecting money. It's about money. Okay? It's one of the major complaints people have about churches. It's about money. Now, um, we, and I'm not trying to say this in a, in a bragging way, but you know that we have made a practice here as a church long before I ever even came and, and uh, maybe, maybe those of you who are, uh, you know, going to do extra things elsewhere, maybe this would be something for you to think about. But this church has made a practice of having the mentality that the Bible says to bring your offering in on the first day of the week. So on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, unless we're having a missionary, we don't pass the plate. Because we don't think that you should be constantly bleeding your turnips dry, if you know what I'm talking about. And I think a lot of churches, that's the mistake they make, is they, it's like you can't, you know, the joke is you, you can't have a church service without passing a plate. And it shouldn't be about that. That should not be what people see us as. Um, the money should be something that comes from God and, and, and the blessing. But that's one thing that we do. Um, there are other, other ways in which we, in essence, sell um, stuff. Now, this church, again, has made a practice not to sell. Uh, but if we, we can use this place as a place to sell things. Okay? That's not good. Um, but that's also similar to what our story is going to be about. Okay? But I don't care how you look at this. What the church is known for, but by the way, selling, uh, you, you just watch TV for a while, you'll find fellows that, that tell you you send them a $25 gift and they'll say, yeah, hanky that they sneezed in and prayed over and sent back to you and you'll be healed, okay? <coughs> the, the church has given itself a very bad name in the world. Not all. I'm not trying to say they all have, but I want you to understand that that is what we fight. Is, is an attitude towards the church that it's not about prayer and about the people. It's about other things. So what I want you to, to work on today in your mind as we study this out is what did God build his house for? What did God build his house for? So start with me in Mark chapter 11, verse 17. Mark 11, 17. Mark 11, 17 says, And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house should be called, of all nations, the house of prayer? But he had made it a den of thieves. Now we're going to go back and look at the context. But I want you to see, this verse clearly states that God's desire is to make not just to here in Frisberg, Westminster, Carroll County, Maryland, but to all nations, the church to be known as a place of prayer. Again, might I ask you, is that what the church is in society in general? Genuinely. I mean, look, I'll just, I'll just be blunt with you. Most churches don't even have a bona fide time of prayer, prayer services anymore. 
we're a house of prayer, but we don't have a straight up time of prayer. Look, I'm not trying to judge other people. I'm trying to ask you to think through what is the church for? And maybe by the time we're done today, we can encourage you to be a little bit more involved in prayer. Maybe a little bit more engaged in what's going on around you and maybe participating more in prayer in the services and in other ways. But also, maybe a recognition of why it's so important to have the right balance. And he says here, I want all nations, where I, the house was called of all nations, the house of prayer. You see, back in the days of Israel, when people looked at the tabernacle, even though they didn't know the Shekinah glory God that dwelt there, they knew He was there, and they knew people talked to Him. And so they were afraid. It's the very reason why at one point when Samuel tells the brothers, not his, but of, of Eli, not to go, and they go, and they lose the ark. The Philistines take it into their temple. <coughs> God begins to do things. Why did they take it into their temple? Because they knew that this object represented a communication with the God of Israel. It was known as a house of prayer. Okay? Now, let's go back to the story here. Verse 12 says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of fig was not yet. He preached on figs. I believe last year, around the time of Palm Sunday. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Just know that he's entering into Jerusalem. He wants something to eat. He sees a fig tree. It doesn't have what it's supposed to. And so, in verse 14, And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they coming, uh, come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and brought, bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Now, the, the picture here for you should be that Jesus comes towards Jerusalem, he wishes for some genuine fruit, he cannot find any, and he curses the tree. We've preached about that already. But understand that the second part, the part two, is the story about him entering into the temple. And in entering into the temple, does he find any fruit? That's the picture represented here. That's why this fig tree is so important. Because he enters in and there's no fruit. And with no fruit, the first thing he does is condemn what is interfering with the fruit. Which is the wrong spirit or attitude. It's not a house of prayer. By the time we're done, I'm going to explain to you biblically what that means, a house of prayer, by looking back at Isaiah. Okay? One of the places Jesus is quoting. We're going to explain to you what it means to be a house of prayer. But I want you to see that what we're talking about here is just like the fig tree, no fruit. And the reason why there's no fruit is because they had the wrong spirit and the wrong attitude. That caused the fruit to be non-existent. Why is the church in trouble today across America? Genuinely in trouble today. You might say, well, it's not. Sure it is. Look, again, I'm not trying to be judgmental. There are plenty of great churches out there. I'm not trying to say that there aren't. But for the most part, churches become a social club. Something to belong to, to have status, and to spend time with your friends. Not a serious place to get down to business with God and to change the things that are wrong in your life. For the most part. Because if you add in all the various what the world would call Christian religions, 
over half of the population of people don't even hear on a regular basis that Jesus died to save them from their sins. Over half of those who even attend church don't hear it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Why? Because, because we've got all the wrong things. Look, I don't want to name any specific name. But I want to tell you that there's a very famous pastor right now um, who, who had his father die. Who wrote a book that if anybody can do it, I can do it. Uh, and I think it goes on, if, if I can do it, you can do it. Something like that. If anybody can do it, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Something like that. Anyways, this fellow wrote the book based on the idea of, I was doing something else. I'm happy doing it. My father died, and he had begun to build this ministry, and I said, well, it's a shame to let that go to waste. I can do this. And he stepped into the pulpit, and now he's preaching full-time to thousands every Sunday, and thousands more, maybe even into the millions on TV. Okay, I'm not saying God doesn't work like that, and he doesn't call people that way, but I'd be worried to begin with. But then you start paying attention to what he's preaching. And it's all powder and fluff. No sin, no repentance, no get right with God. It's all, if I can do it, you can do it. God can use me, he can use you. All encouragement. These people end up with multi-million dollar homes in estates with guarded gates. Is it any wonder our world distrusts the church? Do you understand what I'm after? And I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to tell you the truth. We are in trouble spiritually because we are automatically discounted as one of two things. Just a bunch of people that are weak that are using this to make ourselves feel better. Or a bunch of cuckoos. And in both cases, we're looked at as people who are just trying to take advantage of each other. pretty sad, folks. What should the church be? What does Frizzleburg Bible Church want to be known as? It should be, above all else, that we are known as a house of prayer. That when people look at us, they say, you know what? That church isn't interested in your money. That church isn't interested in the the, the the marking up on the wall how many they saved this year and how many they <coughs> baptized. That church is interested in one thing. The Lord. And at the same time. You see, that's the idea of this passage. But many churches are fruitless because there's something in the way. You can look at Matthew 21 and Luke 19. You'll find that they're very similar. Now let's, let's turn to Luke 19 first. 1946. We'll start with uh, verse 41. Again, you see the heart of Jesus. First story in Mark. Um, he was hungry. And he cursed the tree because it was fruitless. Okay? Now look at verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now we see that he's brokenhearted over the lack of true, genuine fellowship and religion, if you want to call it that, with God. <coughs> he, he's he's brokenhearted. He's weeping. Over the fact that, that the church isn't what it ought to be. And you know that we've shown you scripturally that we believe that we are in the church of Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church. The church that takes a stand on nothing and makes God puke. It doesn't mean every church is that. In every church age, 
There are all kinds of churches. Hopefully we fit into the, the, the category of Philadelphia and so forth. Um, but, uh, you know, as we look at what the Scripture says here, okay, I, I want you to analyze yourself. God is weeping over the lack of impact of the church in the modern day. I honestly believe that. That we're losing strongholds left and right and we are not influencing America the way we used to. We're not. Why is that? What is wrong? Okay? The Bible says, verse 42, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy people, but now they are hid from thine eyes. The scripture clearly here is saying, if you'd only known what God was doing, this wouldn't be it from your eyes. But you can't see it? Why can't you see it? Folks, I'm telling you, it all comes down to the same thing, because look as God builds, because He's going to show us people that can't see it again. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now did this happen to Jerusalem? To the temple? Absolutely. Because they rejected God on the spot. Jesus. They ended up having the whole city sacked and, and everything torn down to where it was no problem for in future years, just a few hundred years down the road, for the Muslims to come in and build on the same spot that was thought to be the place where, where um, Abraham was, was willing to sacrifice Isaac and where, where David was willing uh, to, to make repentance for his mistake of counting the people. And to where God eventually had the establishment of Solomon's temple. That was all cleared away. Because these people were blind and refused to see what God was doing. But notice, it says, verse 45. And he went into the temple and began to cast them out that sold therein and them that bought. Saying unto them, it is written... My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And both of them tell us that he taught daily. Do you notice that if you keep it in context, we had the first one, was the context that he cursed the tree because it was fruitless. And the end result is that the people that he went in to see were fruitless. They weren't achieving what God wanted them to achieve in the temple. And the reason why is because they had the wrong perspective. They were buying and selling. Do you notice that in the second passage, he is condemning them because they couldn't see what they had right in front of them. And he weeps that they did not enjoy the pleasure that God had given them. And so the end result is that he marches into a temple and he shows us again the reason why they're blind is because it's all about money. Let's look at the last one, and then we'll look at our passage in Isaiah 56. Uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. In this last one, I don't necessarily want to, uh, to, to read all the verses preceding to set this up, but I want, I want you to see that we're talking about Jesus riding in on the donkey. Um, verse 3 ends with, uh, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Uh, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass. So Jesus is about ready to enter on the donkey, okay? You get that? That's where we are. And the disciples, verse 6, went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. 
And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Okay, so what is happening here? The people are recognizing that, that this is the, the, the time appointed by our prophets that this man would enter into Jerusalem and become the king. Okay, that's what they're seeing. Appointed time. Before the end of the day, they're going to listen to the people who are running the temple. And those people are going to encourage them to seek different thoughts of Jesus. To where the end result is, they will soon be yelling as a whole, crucify him. Crucify him. It matched the day. I've shown you that in the past year. It matched the day. It was the right day for him to come in. That's why they were there. They were expecting this entry. They didn't know exactly who it was going to be. But as he rode in, they were hailing the new king. This is him. But what happened? Again, let's read the story and see what happens. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. And the multitudes, verse 9, that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're rejoicing and praising God because the king has been sent by God, right? The next verse says, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this child? So because of the ruckus of people who recognized the time period and recognized that Jesus was entering and rejoiced before and after him, the whole city is moved and wondering, who is this? Right? Verse 11, And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. They didn't quite give him all the glory he deserved. Now, of course, I'm arguing at night that the prophet is important. So come back and hear that a little bit tonight. Uh, weather permitting. But uh, verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the table of money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them and so forth. Okay? Now, as you look at the story, we have three different ones. We have the book of Matthew where Jesus enters in a rightful place of leadership and kingship. Yet when he gets there, what does he find happening amongst the people? He's not the king. He's not the king. He's not even looked to as the one who has the responsibility. He's not the king. So, he has to show. He upsets the money changers. He kicks them out. And in a different passage, with a different view, because Matthew's seen it from the eyes of the Jewish people, right? And Mark sees it from the eyes of all mankind. And what does he want? He wants us to be fruitful. And there wasn't any fruit. So they didn't worship their king. Even though they had a king, they didn't worship him, so he had to cast them out. And they were supposed to have fruit, Mark. They didn't have fruit, so he had to cast them out. And if they only knew what the gift was that they had, right there with them in Jerusalem. But he wept, because they couldn't see, so he cast them out. See, all of this comes down to, my house should be a house of prayer. And my house is not a house of prayer, so you don't recognize the king for who he is. You don't let him be the king. There's no fruit, and we're not enjoying the daily things that he brings. The house of prayer achieves those three things. Now, there are other passages we could look at, but I want you to go back with me to Isaiah chapter 56. This is the tie-in chapter, uh, the one that I believe is mostly quoted here. Isaiah chapter 56. going to 
talk specifically about God's desire to be fair and balanced in the way he treats all people. Okay, that's number one. The second thing that you're going to see in this chapter is a, um, a statement by God that that fair and balanced carries even into people who did not originally belong. Okay? And then the third is in his fair and balanced that the people who were in charge who misused and misdealt uh, uh, will end up um, dealing with punishment. Okay? And so those are the three here. Now look with me at 56. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. So he tells us, keep judgment. Do justice. Why? Because God's salvation is at hand. Okay? And it goes on and says, His righteousness is ready to be revealed. So do judgment and do justice. Keep judgment do justice. Make right decisions. True, true judgment is following this book and abiding by its standards. Okay? And justice is uh, giving the right results, the right decisions on the basis of what God is doing. Okay? Now, he tells them to do this because salvation is near and righteousness is preparing to be revealed. Or the right thing, the right way is going to be brought before us. Verse 2, blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it. Blessed is the one who abides by this, who lives this, and who grabs the hold of it and makes it his mantra. Okay? That keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. You'd see that as a blessing, wouldn't you? We keep the right perspective on things, keep God in his right, worshipful place. We see great rejoicing together. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. So what is God right away trying to say? Don't let peace elves and say, Woe is me, I can't fit in. Right? He says, Don't don't let the son of a stranger that have joined to thee and himself speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me. Don't let him say, I don't belong. I can't fit in. That's important. Okay? Because notice in verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs to keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Here's what God says to the person who does what he is blessed to do, which is to serve God in his salvation and righteousness and to have that as the perspective. Guess what? Here's what he does. Verse 5, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Very interesting choice of words. Considering that the first thing that we talk about is a eunuch, which typically, scripturally speaking, is a celibate person. Okay? And God says, I'm going to give you an everlasting name. Now, how do we humans think we get an everlasting name? By leaving a good legacy, not only in what we do, but how we set up our children to start and make a better legacy after that and a better one after that and so forth, right? It's our children that's our legacy. And how we provide them the opportunity to go. But he says... No, children, come in here, worship with me, spend time with me, and I'll put your name on the wall. It's more everlasting than you could ever have with an entire family line of us. I'm just going to tell you, folks, that's pretty special. And God's saying, I have no respect of persons. A stranger is permitted to come in and worship in my place. Why is that so? Look at the next verse, verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord, themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Everyone who does this, doesn't matter who they are, I have a special gift for them. Part of that gift has already been mentioned. I will give them in my house. They get an in. They get to enjoy being a part of the house of God. Not necessarily the church, but in essence, yes. In the throne room of God, to worship with God. A special fellowship. 
That's what they promised. But look at verse 7. Even then, uh, even them will I bring to my holy mountain a stranger and the sons of strangers. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So what does God promise? I'm going to invite them in and make them a part of who I am, which is my house of prayer. Now here's the descriptor of what a house of prayer really represents. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. God says these things are going to be accepted because I am a house of prayer. And what are those things? I'll tell you what they are. They're the repentance. They're offerings and such things that say, I've sinned before you, Lord, and I want to give this to you. And in prayer, I faithfully lift it up and say, please forgive me. And God loves it because it's a covenant keeper. And it's something that he enjoys and he will bless. Because this house ought to be a house of prayer. One in which we encourage each other to come up here and make the repentance needed. To, to pray and to say, Lord, I, I'm, I failed you and I've struggled and I need you. It ought to be a place that encourages people to not only pray about things, but to seek God's face and His will and to find His hand at work in their lives. It ought to be that kind of place. A place where someone can come and make a burnt offering and a sacrifice and find God is pleased. I'm sad to say that in many churches across America, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm sad to say it's more important to take that person, turn them around and tout to everybody, not so we can rejoice with them, but so we can mark off another thing on our sheet. And it's sad. You know what? Our heart should break with person and we should pray for them. There is nothing like a genuine revival service like they used to have. How many of you ever went to the tent revivals? Some of you even had some right out here in the field, didn't you? Okay? And in those tent revivals, they had they walked in the old Salmas Trail and what did people do? They went forward by the droves. What for? So that D.L. Moody could claim all the people that made a difference and changed because of him? He never worried about it. I'll tell you what it was for. Because at that time and in that day and age, it was a house of prayer. Where people got down to business with God and that's what it was all about. Because a house of prayer, if you look up this word, it is prayerful worship. In other words, it's worship in the form of prayer. You and I, I believe, have many things established in this church that set us in a good spot. I don't know about you, I'm never satisfied with just good. I think we should always strive to be better. We should always desire to be more about being a house of prayer, a house of repentance. And I know our culture's changed and we don't have a whole lot of sawdust trails and people don't come forward anymore, but we still can encourage each other to pray. We still can. And we can pray for each other when we're struggling in sin and making bad decisions. I'll tell you, one, one of the, the greatest blessings I've had over the last year is getting to know James. And I'm not trying to build him up, but getting to know James because of what he has done for me spiritually. It's been beyond what you could ever imagine. Because of not asking the typical questions asked by someone who wants to be in the ministry, or who is in the ministry. But instead, asking the right questions and pinpointing them at me so that I have to adjust and fix and 
change. That's a house of prayer. That's what God wants. If you read on, you see that the Lord God which gathereth the outcast of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. In other words, God's going to gather many. And there will be others. Now, I want you to notice that this is talking in Isaiah about other people being gathered because, in essence, the originals, reading between the lines here, but I believe I see it very clearly, the originals are not truly Thus we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and by the way, also John. The story of the originals not bearing fruit, not realizing or seeing what they have, being cast out. Lest you misunderstand me, folks, I am not talking about the church replacing Israel. I'm not talking about that, okay? But I am telling you that God, just like He promised, grafted us in to their tree. He gave us special blessings. He allowed us into the place of worship and our names written in eternity. Just like this says, we are the eunuchs. So will we enjoy what God's called us to in His mountain? The house of Every head down, every eye closed, no one looking around. Maybe there's someone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. If you died today, you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Friend, we've been praying for you. You might not even know who you are. But right here, right now, would you say, I'd, I'd like to be honest and say that I need to receive Jesus as my Savior. Christians, as we sit here together, how do you view the church? How do you view the church God's called you to? no greater blessing for this church than to go into your home and pray for you when you're sick. Whether it's me or a whole group of us on a Wednesday night. There's no greater blessing than to lay hands and pray for the sick. And Folks, there is so much more to be in a house of prayer than just that. Will you worship Him with me in prayer? God to help you make your part of this church a house of prayer. You pray and spend time with God. If you need to come, the altar is open.